One incident in Iraq, um, my wife has just reminded me, was um, the cook fell into a sort of brown study. Now, he was a Kurdish cook, and he had sort of Christianity and Muslim mixed up. But anyway, he was looking very down, you know, and the landlady went to see him and said, you know, what's the matter? He said, I have to go and kill my sister. He said, why? He said, it's the honor of the people. He said, my people. My sister is working with so-and-so, who was my landlady's French friend. She's French, also European. I just, she said, you know, you can't kill your sister. She's working for my sister, you know, over in the other side of Baghdad. He said, I have to go because she has been seen with a man. And they are gossiping, they're talking about her. And I will go into disgrace if she continues like this and I don't do anything. Well, we were in a quandary because we didn't want him, our cook, to go and kill his sister and then say it's an honor killing because he'd go anyway. He won't be welcome back to the either home, you know. But we persuaded him to stay a while. You see, well... We investigated whether these stories was just gossip or whether there was any truth. And we found, <coughs> or at least she found, I didn't find, talking to the her sister, the uh, or relation of my landlady, talking to this, her friend, you see, she said, this is absolute rubbish. She said, she's, ne she's never gone out with a man. She's gone out with me, and my, perhaps I was with a friend, but not, she wasn't with him, I was with him. Oh, she said, so she went and told the cook, and the cook didn't want to kill his sister, so he was easily persuaded not to. But that was... Islam brought to me, you know, but it isn't only Islam, because in Greece we had the same thing, you know. There was the same thing. Your honor was very precise, and no sister of any man who went with a man who was not with a, with a, uh, um, a wife, you know, Ooh, you had to kill her, finito. And in Iraq, they used to confess right away, I've killed my sister, and they'd go up to the magistrate and say, I've killed my sister. And then <coughs> they would be sort of uh, reckoned to be not a criminal, but a person of honor, and they'd be just sent away. You know, he's done an honor killing, finito. He didn't go to prison or anything like that. But for the poor woman, you know, it was finito, you know, and finished. Well, when we left Baghdad, uh, I left Baghdad in the company of a friend of mine for whom I had befriended in the hostel before I met this, before I went into the boarding house. He was an Englishman, 
taught English literature at Baghdad University. And <coughs> he, we went by car, right, with another family, the two cars. One held the mother and uh, her husband and the kids, and the other one held me and Reg, my friend. And after a heavy meal one day, we were motoring along, and dear old Reg fell asleep at the wheel. And luckily, we were going along this mountain ridge, and he fell to the right like that, and the wheel went with him, so we went into a ditch instead of going whoosh into the sea. About, you know, lots of feet down, down there. So that was a life gone, or, or missed. And <clears throat> Reg was hurt because he, he went into the driving mirror and I was hurt because I went forward into the uh, um, the, the, the visor, you know, that comes down and cut right across my eyes like that. Well, we were both found by somebody who told the hospital and we both went into hospital in uh, northern Greece. And we met there an Englishman who was engaged in the tobacco trade. And he sort of looked after us. And my son, who was only four or five years old at that time, um, was in the other vehicle. And they, looked, they said they couldn't take him to England in their, in their vehicle. Um, he'd better stay with us with me, my, me and Reg. So this family took care of Julian, my son. And we were in hospital. And then <coughs> um, Reg had a permanent hip injury, you know. He had to walk, have a walking stick. And he came to the States with this walking stick. And um, I went back to Oxford, although, you know, we went by train from, oh, the name has gone from me, it's one of these northern Greece towns where they export tobacco, you know. And we had to go by train because the car was lost, finito, you know, it was in the ditch and there was nothing left of it. And um, I cured fairly quickly across the eyes, you know. But Reg had busted something on his hip and he's, um, he, was, he could walk, but that's about all. And um, we continued by train through northern Italy and then up, you know, to England and I went to Oxford and he went to um, a neighboring town where his people were, you know. He wasn't married and I wasn't, I didn't have a wife, I just had Julian with me. And um, so that ended my Iraqi experience. But when we got back to Oxford, um, they said, um, they need somebody at the Petrovus Museum. Will you like to go there? I said, okay, lovely. So I went to the Petrovus Museum and saw Tom Pennyman, the curator, and we had a little chat. He said, okay, you have the job. So I was lecturer in anthropology, but I had no college affiliation, you see. And there were a lot like me who had degrees and who could be lecturers, but most of their subjects were advanced subjects and not 
the subjects that were being taught in colleges to undergraduates. So as we didn't have a college or college privileges, we thought we'd invent a college for ourselves, which we did. So I was one of the founders of our St. Cross College and the one of the secretaries came here and on Saturday we had a lunch, you know. Um, there were lots of people there and I was very astounded because I didn't think it had grown that far because <coughs> we were always, we as a college, we started the name St. Cross because there used to be a church there, St. Cross, and uh, just across the road, um, they had uh, an empty building, a sort of mud barn, and that's where we met, and that's where we started the college. And then somebody said, we ought to have a name. I said, Why not St. Cross? Because we were on St. Cross property. And so we called ourselves St. Cross. And we moved from that area northwards to just off the uh, where Blackfriars Monastery was into this little place opposite the Anglican Seminary, which had a lot of empty places, you see. So they, we started, uh, that's where we were. But <clears throat> it was Pusey House and St. Cross for uh, adjoining colleges. Pusey House was a seminary for Anglicans, and it was a large place in the beginning because a lot of Anglicans there, you know, they um, were in the colleges all around. But <coughs> then Anglicans fell off, you know, people, people didn't want to be Anglicans any longer, or priests or Anglican clergy any longer, so they didn't, they had a lot of extra buildings, which are only too pleased to see us occupy, which we did at St. Cross College. And I was sort of a member of St. Cross College, founding member, for about four or five years. Then, this friend of mine who was in the car crash, who had got a place in the US, came to Canada at UBC teaching English literature. And he got married here. He said, he wrote to me and said, why don't you come to Canada for a summer school. So I said, okay, good for a summer holiday, you know. So Julian and I came to Canada and <coughs> I taught at the summer school and I forget what Julian did, but anyhow, he got around himself. He was by then getting, getting much older and could uh, forage for himself, you know. And then Harry Hawthorne, who was the starting member, the founding member of the anthropology department in UBC, said, would you like a position in the department? Think it over anyway. He said, don't answer me now. Go back to Oxford and think it over. Well, I went back to Oxford and thought it over and said to myself, you know, there's a future for me in Canada. I can live there fairly decently or, you know, with Julian and um, we can make it out. Whereas I was having difficulties in Oxford because it wasn't very highly paid and there wasn't any chance of going up, you know, in the world. So 
I said, yes, I'll come across it. I'll. So I left St. Cross and I left Oxford University and came to UBC, which was then run by uh, the Hawthorns, really. She was the one who started the museum and he started the department. And there was uh, Reed, who was the expert on um, the coastal people here, and Belshaw. Now, why Belshaw was a New Zealander, that's why he came here. He didn't know anything about the Indians or, you know, he'd, he'd um, where was his field work? I forget. Anyhow, but he'd been brought up in London, you know. He was a, had a London PhD, um, London School of Economics, and uh, um, <coughs> um, oh, who was it who was in London? The big, big name, Professor. It'll come back in a minute. But anyway, that's why he came, because his professor in London was a New Zealander to start with, and Belshaw was a New Zealander. And so he, when Belshaw was short of a job, he said, well, go to Canada, to UBC, where Hawthorne is, and start the department there. So he was the early one. He's the earliest living person, uh, you know, because Mike, what's the name, Reed, and Mike, um, <coughs> the um, chap who eventually took over the museum from her, from Mrs. Uh, Hawthorne, and built the new museum as you see it. Um, he's dead too, you know, he passed away. Thanks. Ames, Michael Ames, Michael Ames yeah. yes. Um, he passed away. And Cyril is a year older than me, a year, a year and a half. And he's very ill at the moment. Um, I don't know what's the matter with him, he's just old age, you know, 96 or thereabouts. I'm getting on to 94, yeah, so he's a year ahead of me, a year and a half. Um, <clears throat> well, that's how I came to UBC, because I came to the summer school and I enjoyed it. And um, I thought, well, why not? This is good fun here. And um, I was getting a bit tired, not tired of Oxford, but we had changed the curators and the new curator and I did not get on together too well. And I don't know what he thought, but one day one of the young, um, I don't know what you'd call them, they were not educated, but they were museum attendants, you know, who looked after the actual stuff with their hands, workers, you know. And <clears throat> one of them, the young one, came to me and said, do you know, sir, that, what's the name, the curator, when you're away, he comes into your office and goes through your files. I said, really? He said, don't tell anybody that I told you. He said, least of all tell him because he'll sack me. Because I'm not like you, you know, I don't hold my position forever on the word of the curator, but I do. So I said, oh, well, I just want you to know that he goes through your papers when you're away. Well, I, you know, I don't like that sort of thing. 
um, comes into my office and goes through my papers? No. So, anyway. So that was a point at which I had arrived and um, um, I thought, well, let's go to Canada and start afresh. And so I came here. But I've enjoyed it since, yes. We've been okay.